they would generally, what they'd do is they'd go out the streets and march at the time that men would be going to work or coming home from work. The, the, the shift changed. And the thought was that if we had enough people marching at that time, no man who is proud of this situation is going to dare go to work when all these other people here are suggesting perhaps he shouldn't. So this photograph was shown me, of course, I uh, noticed a bunch of women in this photograph, and one of the most important things about the strike was the role that women played. And that's one of the things that happened is when the strike was called, uh, it got national media attention, and reporters came here from Chicago and New York, and they all noticed that a lot of women were involved, and of course none of the women worked in mines, these were the wives of workers. And of course the woman holding the flag was big and iconic, and she was a Croatian who was married to a uh, minor. Uh, and there's a whole other side story there because he actually doesn't pop up much in the story other than simply that he is the husband of this famous woman. They called her Big and or Tall Annie because she was six foot two. I am six foot two, so standing next to me, assuming that she had, didn't have heels on, would be the same height. Uh, she's carrying a gigantic flagpole, uh, and she was very, very well known. She actually became the face of the strike to many people. Uh, Western Federation miners had leadership, they had a president in Charles Moyer, and so on, but everything you read about the, the leaders of the strike, you always hear about Big Annie before you hear about anybody else. Well, the strike got called, it immediately shut down the mines. Every single mine up and down the range got shut down. That's how effective the strike was. So, a few things happened. One of the first things was that the local businesses bombarded Lansing with telegrams and letters asking the governor to send in the National Guard. And it's interesting because Jim McNaughton, who was the president of the Calumet and Hecla, also sent a letter or telegram to uh, Woodbridge Ferris asking for the National Guard to be sent in. And if you read the correspondence that went to Lansing, it was all about how violent the strikers were and how out of control these mobs or mob rules taking over up here. But if you read the letters that Jim McNaughton wrote to his bosses back in Boston, some of which were in code, he would say things like, well, there's a big demonstration of people marching in the street this morning, but nobody got hurt. Um, so you realize that there's two stories being told. Um, the story he's telling to his bosses and the story he's telling to Woodbridge Ferris. Ferris, not knowing what's going on here, did send the National Guard up. The National Guard shows up. Uh, Ferris tells them to not take sides, just because we have a presence up there, settle in, and if anything happens, try to be peacemakers, but you're not to pick sides. So the National Guard shows up. But the National Guard is not the only group that shows up. We also have a lot of deputies show up. And by deputies, this is a major issue that arises in the story of Seaverville. In 1913, if you were an upstanding citizen of this county and lived here long enough, you could be deputized as a deputy sheriff. And by being deputized, you'd swear an oath to the oath of law, and they'd give you a badge and a gun, and you were allowed to accompany actual police officers in the conduct of their duties. You could not go out and act on your own. But the bigger problem is, you also could not deputize people who were not residents of the county. Despite that, the mines started deputizing everybody they could. So there were literally thousands of people, they think, in Hope County who were deputized. Many of them were residents who were uh, friendly with the mines, not strikers, but a lot of them were strike breakers. And that's a, a, a term that you don't hear that much anymore because strike breakers uh, don't exist. But in 1913, there were companies like Pinkerton, Burns, Asher, and a company called Wild Mahon, or Waddell Mahon, that um, specialized in breaking up strikes. And they were bringing them from New York and Chicago. And these guys would actually, they'd be paid three bucks a day, and they'd be sent to trouble spots, or they'd be sent to places where there were picketers and they would cause conflicts with them. And a lot of these strike breakers were also deputized. Even though they were from out of state, they were not residents. And so, I'm also an attorney, as Frank pointed out. One thing I'd like you to know is that if 